Well then, thank you and welcome everyone to my talk about performance. Um, so this is a talk uh, that will try to explain to you uh, why performance is not only about micro optimizations, because this is this is something um, that is covered by a lot of other talks uh, that we've seen. Um, so first thing first, who am I? So I'm Clément Grégoire. I've been programming uh, uh, in C++ for more than 10 years now. Uh, I've been a game engine uh, developer uh, on various uh, games such as Microsoft Flight Simulator, and uh, I ported several games to consoles. Um, and as a game the engineer, um, I had to deal with performance quite a lot, and software optimization kind of became my daily job. Um, so now I'm the co-founder and consultant, uh, and a consultant at Silicium. Um, and I work in the domain of uh, performance. So this talk is not meant to convince, to convince you that performance is important. There are other people that uh, can do that uh, did those kind of talks that did it way better than I could ever do. Uh, I've put a link. Uh, it's one of the talks that you can see um, if you need convincing. Uh, you probably don't if you're at this talk right now. Um, this is, as I explained, not a micro benchmarking talk. Um, I will try to show you that you need uh, to start by taking a step back and, to, and take a look at the uh, macro view of your system before diving it, uh, diving in uh, uh, your code. And this is also not specific to C++. Uh, to C++. Um, this is kind of a general um, talk about performance, um, how, and it will give you some methods, some theory, and then we'll dive in into a use case uh, that I have. Um, could I have, please, uh, could, could I please have a, a raise of hand uh, for those who did uh, performance work before? Just to have a quick uh, look. Okay, so maybe a third of the participants. Okay, interesting. So uh, I start by um, telling you uh, what software performance is, and it's and I, I can already tell you that it's not only about speed. Um, so. Obviously, it's about speed uh, first. Uh, so how long does it, does it take for a task to execute? Uh, what is the delay, the latency before you receive data? So uh, it's linked to your CPU. It can be linked to your GPU, to your network stack. Uh, it can be about the startup time and loading time of your applications. Uh, it could be all those things. Um, and it matters for your users um, who never Heard about Photoshop that takes minutes to to start, um, and that that can be a real problem. And an example that we had recently was uh, the GTA V uh, game that um, took a, a really long time uh, to to start a, in a multiplayer session, uh, just because they uh, they wrote their own JSON parser, and it was not scaling really well. Uh, but after speed, um, there comes the memory usage of your computer. Um, and so you have to keep a balance between speed, memory, and other uh, things. Um, so when we talk about memory, we, we can ask ourselves, how much memory can we afford to use? Um, this is very important in certain domains, such as embedded uh, systems, where you have a limited amount of memory. Um, this is nowadays... Um, an issue too in cloud uh, servers and services as you pay based on the amount of memory you use. Uh, obviously in video games, uh, you have very different hardware. Uh, you have PC and you have consoles and some consoles nowadays uh, still have only eight gigabytes 
uh, of RAM, while some users uh, of yours might have uh, 16, 32, even 64 sometimes. So you have to, um, to keep that in mind. And of course, uh, you need to uh, play nice with other applications of your system. Uh, perhaps the user has a browser, perhaps he has Discord, perhaps he has uh, some music uh, being played uh, behind. And if you use too much memory, well, they won't be able to multitask as efficiently. Um, there's also the issue of storage. So by storage, I mean, what is the size of your application, its package, its assets? Um, how long will it take to download? Uh, for example, in the embedded domain, this is an issue because um, you, if you need to uh, download uh, an update, you don't always have an internet connection or sometimes it's, it can cost a lot to, uh, to do that update. Uh, nowadays, for those familiar with, with Docker, um, you have to optimize your images a bit because otherwise, if you use it, uh, for example, in your inter uh, continuous integration, it will take more time to spin up your virtual machine, et cetera. And obviously games, uh, some games nowadays um, weigh uh, more than uh, hundreds of gigabytes. Um, this can be an issue for people that have uh, low internet bandwidth. Uh, and obviously web, uh, because it's uh, directly correlated to the um, time it takes to load your uh, web page. Um, and so uh, a few um, uh, tri trivia uh, points. Uh, Fallout 60, uh, 76, day one patch was actually larger than the actual game, which is kind of weird because it should only be a patch. Um, I saw, I've also seen uh, a poor point that was uh, that weighed uh, more than one and a half gigabytes. Um, this is an issue because you could actually download the video and it would be smaller than that. And of course, we can speak about the resilience of the system, uh, which may be linked to its performance. Um, it could be a security issue uh, because you can have denial of service. Uh, you also need to scale up and to stay available. Uh, when a cloud provider uh, will tell you I'm available 99.999% of the time, it's something that is really important and is, a, a, is linked to performance. And uh, the last thing that I want to, you to keep in mind is that you have to keep your code, uh, your code base maintainable. Um, you need to uh, be able to prototype. You need to be able to identify uh, performance issues uh, really quickly. You need to be able to do updates quickly. And the iteration and build time is something um, that is very important in some domains, um, even though in C++, we, uh, we often have the issue. Um, and especially one of my pet peeves uh, is the debug mode performance. Uh, this is something that um, a lot of people say, just have unit tests, etc. but you can't always uh, just uh, find things in uh, unit tests. When you have a, a large system, a large application, uh, you do need to have more context. You do need to, uh, to be able to step into the debugger to see variables, etc. And if it takes an hour to start your applications, that's an issue. So, now that you know a bit uh, a bit more about performance, uh, I will be talking about optimizations and where to begin. So for me, uh, the best optimization cycle is uh, starts with uh, defining your target. Uh, then you start measuring um, your application. You refine the target because sometimes uh, you realize that your target is just not. Um, possible or, or you realize that um, things uh, that are taking time are not the things you thought would take time. And then you do a macro optimization as, as much as possible. And then if you really need to uh, do micro optimizations and you cycle, you measure again, you optimize, you measure again, you optimize. Um, so 
I said that we need to define the targets and we need to define uh, clear objectives. So I will give you a few examples. Um, in a game, for example, you want to have 60 frames uh, per second on PC. That's the um, number of images you will uh, display uh, per second. Um, you can say that you limit uh, your application to eight gigabytes of memory uh, because you don't have more. And if you try to use more, your application may crash or whatever. Uh, you may want your web page to be loading under a second. Uh, this, is, uh, this has been proven to be linked directly uh, to sales for uh, uh, for uh, uh, platforms that, uh, such as eBay, Amazon, anything that is selling uh, um, things to your clients. If they see that it takes too long to to load, they will just bail out. And another performance objective could be to simply be the best. And um, that's when you have free time. That's when it uh, uh, is that when you can afford it. Uh, it could be a marketing thing, uh, but well, you need time to do it. Um, and when defining your targets, you need to consider uh, if this can actually be done. Uh, some things are just not ready, uh, can, cannot be done because of the hardware. Uh, for example, Microsoft Flight Simulator uh, needs terabytes of data that is stored on the cloud uh, for storing the um, aerial imagery. Uh, so the, the satellite, uh, uh, the uh, the, the photos that are taken from space, basically. Uh, and so 10 years ago, this was just not possible, not only because of the storage, but also because uh, the home uh, internet connection that uh, gamers had was not fast enough. Um, so that's why we couldn't do it. Uh, you can also ask yourself, how long will it take uh, to optimize uh, your um, your program. Uh, this is something that you may not know in advance, but still try to make a guess and you will iterate then uh, once you start measuring. And another option, uh, obviously, is to buy better hardware. Uh, this is less and less true. Um, now that we're reaching the limits of the processors and now you have to go parallel, but even if you go parallel, uh, not everything can scale uh, up or horizontally. Um, there are other laws that can show that based on the parallel um, portion of your program, having more than X uh, cores uh, will not help. Um, so now that you have your targets, you need to start uh, measuring. And that's actually, for me, the most important part of uh, software performance analysis. Um, you need to, uh, when you define your, uh, when you want to analyze performance, you need to have uh, a test case uh, that is reproducible as much as possible. You, you need it to be as deterministic as possible. So you need to craft uh, a scenario that you know you can reproduce and do easily. It needs to be uh, as fast as possible uh, to start because you will be iterating a, a lot to know if uh, your changes actually did help. And you need to make sure that um, the environment won't modify uh, your results. The choice of inputs is also very important. Um, so the size of your inputs must be realistic. Uh, just keep in mind that you're probably not working at Google or Netflix. You probably won't have millions of end users. Uh, if your server can, uh, can handle a few thousand, that's great. If that's your use case. Um, but you can also take the opposite approach and say, I want to see uh, my uh, put my, my my system at at its limits to know what it is. So that's another approach. Uh, but you have to keep in mind uh, the um, what those limits are and why you choose this data, um, because this will have. Um, um, a big impact on the optimizations you can do, uh, and also the choices that you will make. Some choices uh, of optimizations might mean that um, you will pay a cost, 
uh, always pay your cost, even if you have uh, a small amount of data, and uh, but be faster later, and uh, the opposite is also true. So usually what people do is they take a measurement. Uh, so for example, your main loop was, uh, uh, your main loop duration was uh, 60.8 uh, milliseconds before your changes. You do some changes, some optimizations, you measure again and you get 16.6 uh, uh, milliseconds. So, well, that's, a, that's an improvement, that's great. Um, so just push it, right? Shape it. Um, or maybe not. Maybe not. Why? Uh, because uh, you're not measuring only your application. You measure it within a certain context and within a, a certain environment. And basically, what you need to first uh, keep in mind is do not leave applications uh, running in the background. Do not leave YouTube, do not uh, keep a uh, web browser open, do not keep your uh, video conference uh, calls on, et cetera, et cetera, as I will have an impact. But that's, that's not all. Um, you also need to keep in mind that nowadays CPUs and GPUs uh, can scale up and scale down their frequencies to save uh, on uh, a bit on power consumption. And so the first thing you need to do uh, is to lock your uh, CPU or GPU frequency so that it doesn't happen because it can go from single to, dub to uh, from single to double the performance uh, just uh, depending on what was running just before your program. Also be wary of uh, the temperature and the cooling of your system and its power supply. Uh, we once saw some researchers that had a program with a um, cyclic uh, measurement of performance. And so they saw that uh, their program would run uh, about every 20 seconds faster. And they couldn't figure why, because the code was the same, uh, whatever they, they did, it, they couldn't change it. And in the end, uh, what they realized was that uh, they had a fan in front of the computer that was uh, on which they were measuring. And when the fan was actually blowing uh, wind uh, on the computer, it was cooling it down. And so the, uh, the CPU could actually do more uh, more computing. Um, there are also lots of uh, many other um, things that can have an impact on the stability of your environment. It could be in C++ your link order. Your linker might put functions in some order and then you recompile and it will be an, at another place. It won't be aligned the same way. Um, sometimes you just run uh, your application and um, your allocator will put data uh, with a different alignment at a different location. Uh, you could have different environment, uh, environment variables or working directory, and this all can have an impact on performance. So there are so many things that can impact uh, your measurements that the only solution in the end is to repeat your experiments. Just don't take one measurement. Uh, do it once, uh, do, do, do it two, three, four, five times and compare those, um, those results. And if possible, even use statistical algorithms um, uh, and stati st statistical tests uh, to compare your results. Um, one thing that I also see very often and that bothers me a lot, uh, is the misuse of units. And by that, uh, I don't mean uh, people uh, mistaking bits for bytes or something. No, uh, what I mean is that uh, you, you must know what's behind the, your unit. So do not use a percentage when talking about uh, improvements of a regression if there's another way to describe it. Uh, to, to describe it. So a cash miss rate, it's a percentage by default, so you can't say anything else than percentage, that's fine. Branch miss prediction, the same thing. However, as soon as you talk about timings, about memory, or any other unit that really is a, um, 
um, we well, yeah, as a, a unit uh, that is well defined, please uh, use that unit. So for timings, it could be milliseconds, it could be seconds, it could be microseconds. Uh, just use that one. And also, and so the the main reason I say that that's because uh, we have to often see people uh, using units that are in operations per x. So it could be per second, uh, it could be per um, I don't know, uh, many things, but the issue uh, of that, uh, for example, when you use uh, frame per, frames per second or the throughput, um, is that if you, uh, you if you do different modifications and you do them in a different order, the actual improvement uh, will not be the same because uh, that's not linear. So that's okay for marketing effects. Oh, look, uh, <laughs> this was running at uh, 30 FPS and now it's uh, 40 FPS. Well, great, but that doesn't tell you the amount of work that has been done uh, in this optimization. Uh, also, please try to avoid um, uh, averages. Um, averages are bad uh, usually because, for example, if you want uh, 60 uh, frame per seconds, and you have uh, one frame that is as uh, that is at uh, 50, one at 70, and you you have those that are interleaved. Uh, on average, you will have 60 frames per second, um, but that's not what you want. The, it's not smooth, so you need to keep in mind um uh, uh, those uh, things and use uh, something that is more reliable such as percentiles uh, use statistical tests uh, look at the shape that is made by all your me measurements and so know that you know uh, what to measure and uh, you need to know how and uh, the tools we use are called profilers uh, and there are uh, different uh, different kind of profilers that use different techniques, uh, which are um, a bit complementary, uh, but you, you need to know the difference. So the first thing, uh, the first uh, category of profilers is sampling-based profilers. Uh, what those do is basically uh, they take a snapshot of the call stacks of your uh, program every uh, certain amount of times. It could be uh, 10 times per milliseconds. It could be more, it could be less. Um, this is really helpful because you can have quick results. Uh, you don't need to change your code to have results. Um, however, um, it can uh, lead to issues uh, because the, the, when you're doing uh, I.O., it might not uh, uh, always be sampled. The precision is not um, really uh, reliable. Uh, the time spent in a function uh, might not be the useful time. Um, and by that, I mean that if you're, for example, in a game, uh, you're waiting for the, ref uh, the screen to finish, its re uh, to finish refreshing, um, well, you know that you're going to wait. And if the profiler tells you, you've been waiting for 30% uh, of the time uh, for the screen, well, it doesn't give you any information except you, you've been waiting for the screen and that's what you want, but that's just noise. Um, so that's what Linux Perf does, uh, Visual Studio 2, uh, Intel Vtune, uh, but Intel Vtune has more fun uh, functionality, uh, but that's the way they work. Um, so some people tried to use automatic instrumentation using directly the compiler. Um, I would say avoid it almost every single time. The issue with automatic instrumentation uh, is that you will... Um, um, you, you will have every single function, uh, except those that are in line, uh, that will uh, be uh, taken into account and that will be measured. And the cost of the measurements might lead you astray and, um, and uh, can give you very different results than if you did not have uh, this instrumentation. Uh, so it may be useful to know the number of function calls uh, that are done to, to, to a given function, but that's pretty much uh, in, uh, that's pretty much uh, all it's good for. Um, so instead of doing automatic instrumentation, uh, you can do manual instrumentation. Um, 
this time you're doing it to change your code, but it's not as much uh, as an issue as some may think. The good thing about this uh, is that it's precise. You have a macro and logic uh, and logical uh, view of your program because you uh, you are the one who puts your uh, your markers. Um, uh, and your instrumentations. The main issue is that you have no details about what's happening. So you may know that uh, uh, you're spending some time in some update function, but you don't know what in this function may, may take time. So you either need to add uh, more instrumentation or find the details uh, another way. And so that's why the best profilers are a mix of both worlds. Um, and there are quite a few of those. There's Microsoft Pix for Windows, Tracy, Optic, Superluminal, uh, Google has no uh, Perfetto. There are many, many of those, and I encourage you to take a look at a few of those. Um, and if I had a, a wish list, um, a, pro, a good profiler for me should be lightweight uh, because you need to be able to start it fast. Um, you, it needs to be cross-platform. Uh, it may not uh, be your case uh, if you're just running on Windows or just on Linux. Uh, it needs to be accurate. Uh, again, your, me your measurements need to be uh, reliable. You need multi-threading support. So it needs to be able to display the name of the threads. It needs to be able to display context switches. Um, otherwise, you might uh, miss some important uh, optimizations. And there's a lot of other things uh, that uh, can be done. Uh, I just won't list it. They are available in the slides. Um, and so I said that I won't talk about micro-optimization, uh, micro so I will talk about macro-optimization. I will, uh, will give you a few uh, pointers at what you could do. So the first thing that you can do when you check uh, a project for performance um, is the compilation flags. This is really quick to check. This is an easy test, and most and most of the time, uh, they are not set correctly. Um, so on GCC, Clang, Dash, or Free, the architecture, the target architecture is very important. If you know that we will only run on some given server, uh, do use the, um, the MARC or equivalent for the compilers to tell the compiler that you are optimi opti optimizing for a given uh, CPU. Uh, please do also use link time optimizations. Uh, this is very important and beware of fast math. This can improve things a lot, but at the cost of precision. And the best optimi uh, of optimizations for me is to do nothing, because if you do nothing, it doesn't have a cost. Avoid any uh, needed processing. Uh, if you're uh, computing stuff, but you're not uh, using it afterwards, then it's useless. Just don't do it. Uh, avoid uh, unneeded initializations, copies. Please do avoid allocations. Uh, very often I heard that oh, nowadays allocators are performant, allocators are fast, etc., etc. Allocations mean uh, several things things. Uh, your allocator needs to do bookkeeping. Uh, you, uh, you will have more indirections uh, and pointer chasing. Uh, just try to minimize allocations. And please do use reserve uh, on vector when you can. Um, also, avoid any mutex or critical section. Uh, anything that needs synchronization should be as small as possible. Reduce the, the amount of code that it grants. Um, also, avoid duplicated function calls because um, sometimes it's abstracted away uh, and you don't see it at first. Um, but uh, that's why you need to instrument and to really take a look at what's happening. Sometimes you have a, a small function that is a, at the beginning of your code and you just call it uh, over and over again on many elements, but that, that thing could be uh, put in common. So just put it out of the loop. 
Um, another macro optimization uh, that I, I really like uh, and requires uh, a, a functional view of your program uh, is to adapt your data or your design. Uh, sometimes um, you can just uh, adapt what you're doing or what the use case is to be more performant. Uh, one example uh, that uh, is playing here, uh, if you have a small bush, uh, a small tree that needs to be uh, displayed, maybe you don't actually need uh, to display all the leaves. You could just use uh, billboard faces uh, to simulate what's being um, shown to the user and they will probably not see the difference. Another example is that, uh, still in a game, um, if you have too many elements to draw, uh, maybe just consider adding some fog. And since you can see what's behind the fog, well, you don't need to draw it. That's as simple as that. So in order of efficiency, I would say that you need to do less. Uh, or do it faster. You can prepare data, you can compress uh, files, you can pre-compute tables, uh, then you can use uh, multiple cores, and then obviously you can use caching. Uh, do be careful with caching. Uh, I've seen a lot of people uh, having problems with, ca with caching later on. It's great at first, uh, but it will hide uh, performance issues. Um, so now I will uh, tell you a bit uh, of the story and walk, through, walk you through um, uh, the process that I had uh, to optimize uh, WebKit, which is uh, the equivalent of a web browser uh, that was in a game. So for a bit of context, uh, WebKit was used to display not only UIs, but also game components. Uh, those change really often. Uh, for example, they can display the position of your character, its life, et cetera, et cetera. And it may change uh, a lot. So you have a lot of updates and that's not really what the web was done in the first place. But that's how it is. And so we needed to, uh, to um, to optimize that. Our target uh, in the case of the game is 60 or 30 frames per second. That's only 33 or 16 milliseconds. That's not a lot. Uh, you may run it on a console where you don't have a just-in-time compilation of JavaScript. Uh, that is an issue because you lose a lot of performance, uh, but actually not that much. It depends. Uh, we also had an old WebKit version from uh, 2016. Uh, so that was not that old when we started, but now it's five years old. Uh, and we could see very frequent uh, freezes in the game. So as I said, you should start by measuring. Um, and here we already have our target. We just need to the game uh, not to freeze and to be smart. So start measuring data. You start up your favorite profiler, and this is most likely what you will see. Um, if someone uh, was already uh, using the profiler, you will see your main thread that is already named, uh, which is great. Uh, that means that uh, so somebody already did some work. And all the squares of colors you can see right, uh, right now, um, those are instrumentation. Um, that's, so that's code that you know, and um, someone already did the work for you, so that's great. But at the bottom, you can see that there is um, another thread that has no name. Uh, that's an issue uh, because you don't even know where to begin. Uh, even when debugging, it, it would be great to have names for uh, your threads and not just an ID. So that's really a red flag when you see a thread that is not named because that means that probably nobody uh, ever uh, took a look at its performance. And so we can see that there's no instrumentation and uh, the black bars are actually uh, the sampling of the call stacks and the red lines are context switches. Uh, context switches happen when your thread goes to sleep or needs some information from uh, your operating system. But um, basically that, that's bad and that's why it's in red. 
So you start instrumenting your code, uh, and it looks like this. You have a, a macro, here it's perf uh, region F for function, and uh, it will instrument your code by taking the name of the function it's in it. Uh, it's in. So here we would have uh, engine uh, engine update that would be displayed in your profiler, or you could you could just uh, give it uh, a name uh, that is more friendly or makes more sense to you. You can give it a category or a color, which is really great because um, um, visually it will pop up, uh, and and it's really useful to spot uh, what's wrong because you're. Uh, your brain is actually wired on such things. So do keep in mind uh, to keep the colors uh, of your different categories. Then you can also uh, give more context uh, to, uh, your, uh, to the region of code you're, you are um, measuring, uh, which is nice because when you have thousands of units or elements that you are updating, but only uh, just a few are taking time, you actually need to know which one, uh, which one are uh, taking time. So if you can have a name, a position or anything, that's great. And so once it's instrumented, this is uh, what it looks like for us. So you have the UI frame, which is the, the update of the UI, and you can see execute JS timers. That's, basic, that's basically the JavaScript code that is running. And then you see GSC ip collect. And for those who are not aware, um, JavaScript, uh, releases allocations of memory, of memory automatically for you once it's not referenced. Uh, that's not like C++. And that can lead to issues. And here we have a big issue because the garbage collector takes a lot of time. And not only does it take a lot of, uh, a lot of time, it happens whenever, wherever it wants. So what do we do now that we identified the issue? Well, there are many options. Uh, we could tweak the garbage collector parameters. Uh, some people may be uh, familiar with the things, uh, especially in the Java, uh, Java world, uh, but that's not really what we want to do. Uh, you could uh, give more um, more memory to the heap, uh, to the to the garbage collector, uh, but that's not a solution when you have a, a limited system uh, such as a, a game console. We could have optimized the garbage collector itself, uh, but that would take time. Uh, we did not know the code of WebKit, um, so that's not really what we want to do. Uh, we could make it less blocking, and by that I mean uh, we could make it asynchronous maybe, or maybe not, we'll have to see. Um, we could also rewrite all our JavaScript code in C++, um, but that will not work when we uh, you have already thousand, thousands of lines of JavaScript. And uh, you could also just reduce the amount of data to process because the garbage collector uh, processes um, allocations of memory, so just try to do less allocations, maybe. Or we could ship it, uh, ship the game like this. Uh, that won't do because the players won't be happy. So we have to pick one, and we started by reducing the amount of data to process. Um, the reason is it's kind of easy uh, to spot such uh, issues. Uh, you just have to log um, the memory usage, uh, and at the same time, you can even spot uh, other performance problems that are uh, related to your JavaScript code. So we could do both. Uh, at, um, on one side, optimize the memory allocations, and at the same time, optimize the JavaScript code. Um, sadly, that was not enough. Even if I, if I remember correctly, we had uh, about a 30% um, increase uh, in speed. Um, because uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, not only do you not control when the garbage collection will happen, um, but uh, it kind of happens whenever it wants. And so we still add some freezes due, due to it. And one thing we started to realize uh, when, we, when we instrumented and measured more and more and more, 
was that sometimes the garbage collector uh, would take 70 milliseconds. That's a lot. Uh, that's uh, more than two frames at 30 FPS. Um, and sometimes it would only uh, take 10 milliseconds. And the reason why is that there are actually two kinds of garbage collection. Uh, there's a full garbage collection that will uh, pass and iterate over all their locations to know if they can raise them. And then uh, there's the hidden garbage collection um, that will iterate only over the objects that were allocated recently. Uh, and by recently, I mean since the large garbage collection or that were changed since the la large garbage collection. So um, this method relies on the fact that um, uh, the objects uh, that we release are most probably the one that were allocated uh, recently. And this is really what you want in a game, uh, because usually you have uh, allocations at the beginning uh, of your level, and then it will just be updates. And so the allocations are simply the JavaScript code running, uh, because the constructs uh, are made that way, and uh, you do not, not have a stack, so everything will lead to allocations. Uh, but it's really just the update of the code. So the most recent allocations are already what we want uh, to collect. And this is what you can see here uh, in the green line. Uh, some, uh, the vertical uh, parts are when the garbage collector happen. Um, and so we, we quickly realized that um, the code of WebKit uh, always triggered a full garbage collection uh, after an Eden collection. Not right after, but the next garbage collection would always be a full one. So the solution we had was just to say, uh, instead of always triggering the full garbage collection, only do it if there's a significant amount of memory that you could not collect recently. And so that, that, that helped a lot. Um, but we still have the issue of when the garbage collector is, uh, is allowed to run. And as you can see here, um, the burn marks of the garbage collector, uh, and it happens all the time, everywhere. And so that's an issue because you actually, we, we want to control what happens. And not only uh, do we not know, uh, control when it happens, but when it does try to do a step of garbage collection, uh, it, has, it actually has to be conservative. So it needs to take a look at all the um, data that is in the current um, stack of the function uh, to, to just say, hey, don't touch that. Maybe it will be gone, maybe not, uh, but it's in use. And so that's what the stop and resume the periphery is uh, in the garbage collector. And as you can see, uh, the actual user, useful work in green is way smaller than the stop and resume the periphery. Um, and that's uh, mainly due to the way uh, the steps are scheduled uh, and, and the scheduler of WebKit, uh, how it works. It's just not designed uh, for such um, work. And so if we take a step back and look at uh, what a normal frame of a game uh, looks from very far. You have your game logic, uh, you have your UI logic that is on, a, on another thread, and you have a synchronis uh, synchronization point that you can't really get rid of uh, due to uh, dependencies, uh, mainly due to rendering and other things. And so usually when you don't have the garbage collector, it's just fine. Uh, everything fits in within uh, two uh, uh, virtual synchronization of your screens. Uh, and so the user won't, th won't notice uh, any issue. However, when the garbage collector uh, comes in, uh, it will delay the end of the UI logic. And by delaying the end of the UI logic, you also uh, delay the beginning of the rendering and other um, modules. And you will end up missing your deadline, which is bad. So the solution we came uh, with, we, we came up with, is very simple. Instead of following the garbage collector to run uh, whenever it wants during the JavaScript execution, just tell it, no, you're not allowed to run. And at the end of our UI logic, uh, 
you know, we give it uh, we give it uh, some budget. We give it uh, the uh, until the end of the frame and even a bit more uh, to finish its work. And that way, you're not moving the synchronization point. Uh, you're still doing more or less the same work, but you you don't have frame drops, and that's very important. And a bonus point is that since it's not executing during the JavaScript, you don't have those stop the periphery and resume the periphery anymore. Uh, at least it doesn't have the same costs. And so not only uh, did we remove the issue of the frequent freezes, but we actually made the garbage collector faster. Um, we then took another approach, as I mentioned. Um, uh, the, the WebKit code was kind of old. Uh, it was from 2016. And we uh, we saw that uh, a year or two later, there were optimizations that were made to uh, take advantage of the multiple cores you have on your computer. And so we thought, well, let's give it a try. That might help uh, a bit more. And as you can see, this is just uh, um, the single threaded part uh, that took about six, 16 milliseconds in this case, which is a bit too much, but that's what it was in this case. And when we enabled the multi-threading, this is what we got, which is obviously bad. As you can see, there are a lot of holes. You don't need to look at the details, but what you need to see is that most of the parts are grayed out. Uh, when uh, in this profiler, um, the markers are, uh, are grayed out, um, that means that the thread is not actually doing work. Uh, it's suspended. Uh, so that's most of the time uh, that we spend suspended. And on the left, there is one big thing that took a bit of time to understand. Um, it's actually the, the fact that threads are being recreated. Um, WebKit does use a, a thread pool uh, and recycles the threads. Uh, but the issue is that they decided for some reason um, that those so those would be um, uh, deleted after a certain amount of time, and that time was 10 milliseconds, uh, which is less than a frame, so the duration of the frame. So obviously, every single time, we would recreate all the threads that were needed. So we fixed that, and this is what we got. Uh, that looks a bit better. Uh, we can see on the left side um, that we have uh, parallel th uh, things that are being done. But weirdly, the UI thread on top uh, is grayed out for a, a, a huge part. And so does most of the thread, except the one at the bottom. And that's because um, the code in WebKit actually does not scale uh, in our use case. It's just spending too much time on uh, things allocated by uh, the HTML page somehow. We don't really, we didn't investigate why, but it took more time. And it even took more time than the single threaded version in the end. So, yeah. What we did was just keep the single threaded version because not only the multi-threaded version was taking more time, it was also uh, eating more uh, CPU resources because it, it was using more cores and doing a lot of context switches. Obviously, there are many more optimizations uh, and some were actually micro-optimizations, but just by tweaking a few things, uh, we were able to, to get a really good performance just by telling the garbage collector when and how, for how long it could run. Um, and so the other optimizations we had were not really uh, C++ specific, uh, though we did reduce a lot of string copies for C++ and JavaScript communications. That's something that uh, people usually neglect somehow. I don't know why. Even the WebKit uh, team at some point said, oh, string copies are cheap. Uh, but by removing string copies, uh, in our case, we were able to make our code uh, about twice faster. So that's 
a lot. Uh, we also reduced the allocations and interactions it work it itself. Uh, it was chasing pointers everywhere, uh, which were not needed. So we did change a bit uh, uh, things uh, in WebKit. Um, in JavaScript, uh, getters and setters actually do trigger a slow pass in the virtual machine. Uh, that's something that is specific to WebKit, but if you ever do JavaScript and need to optimize JavaScript, that's good to know um, because it's really surprising. You would expect it to be the same cost as a function call, but it's not. Um, do keep in mind uh, that any interaction with DOM, um, by DOM we mean uh, the, H, uh, the documents, uh, so uh, the HTML documents, uh, will have a cost. Even changing text uh, might trigger allocations if you do not do it correctly. And some functions might trigger um, uh, layouts uh, or a uh, refresh of the layout. And that's something that you can actually uh, see in other frameworks. And so do keep in mind that uh, such functions, uh, even in Qt, for example, may have um, indesirable effects. And so if you had to have one takeaway of this talk is please measure measure and measure and understand what you measure. That's the critical part because if you don't understand what you measure, you might think that you're making things better, but actually making it worse. And that's the end of my talk. Uh, thank you. And if you have any questions, I will answer them. So I've got a question from Robin that is asking what profiler I'm using. Uh, I'm actually using multiple ones. It depends on the use case, on what I want to profile, uh, on the application and the OS. I tend to use Microsoft PIX uh, because uh, this is the one that I'm most familiar with, uh, but I really like Optic and Tracy too. Um, so we've got an anonymous spectator um, that asks, is computing a wedge of measurements a bad practice, even if we check that standard deviation between measurements are acceptable? Um, I would say it depends. If It depends if you're doing micro benchmarking or benchmarking something that is bigger. But for example, uh, if you take um, a web page, uh, and you take a look at the time it takes uh, to answer and to deliver uh, content in it, uh, you don't actually want to know uh, the average because what matters is actually uh, the, the worst part, uh, that, uh, the worst thing that could happen. That's the 99% uh, uh, of the time you want to be below a certain amount and even that is not really enough. Um, Mainly because uh, if you take a look at the 99th percentile, uh, but you have uh, 20 requests, uh, where every single time you, you load a web page, you tend to uh, hit that percentage. So when you're doing micro benchmarking, I would say it's pretty much okay in certain cases, uh, because the, um, um, the, the accuracy of your clock may be lower than the actual work. But if it's not the case, please do not use averages. And even if you use, uh, do use uh, averages, uh, please do use them carefully and use statistical tests behind it. Um, so, uh, Question from Alan Lee. Uh, in an earlier slide, there was a macro with the name tag, uh, perf tag. Does that send a, mar a marker to a profiler? Um, so I will go back to the slide. Um, so it really depends on the profiler. Some profilers do not support those kind of tags. Uh, and on those, uh, I usually map uh, the macro to simply another uh, marker. 
uh, but uh, on some profilers, it's actually metadata. And the good thing about the, um, uh, those tags is that you don't need to know the value uh, before, uh, before doing the actual work and before starting the measurement. Uh, it can be useful if you want to know uh, what was the value before your uh, code and after, for example. Mm. Oh, one more question from Robin. Maybe an unrelated co question, but uh, if we have time, what was your journey to manage to work in video games? Did you love it? Um, uh, my journey was actually pretty simple because I knew that I wanted to do video games. I had been uh, doing uh, Umbrew games uh, on console uh, before even uh, entering uh, uh, my, my, my university. Uh, and then I went to uh, um, do a, a double degree um, in uh, Canada. Um, and it was specialized in video games. And so that's how I, I got in it. Um, I did love it and I still do. Uh, that's uh, a great um, environment, but it kind of depends on the studio you work in it. 